This is the virus that we study, which is canine parvovirus, which in 1978 jumped from cats into dogs and created a new host range. And the changes that we see are also found in the same region. So the virus is gradually accumulating changes, and over time it's becoming better adapted to dogs. Once it adapted to its new victim, the virus spread throughout the world in barely six months. A new disease and a new virus had appeared in the animal world. But who can say that it won't mutate one day and affect human beings? Well, when you're out in Montana in the beautiful nature and fishing and looking at the birds and the animals and the cranes and things, a lot of times it's hard to remember that many of the infectious diseases which are emerging around the world today actually are coming from animals. All the new diseases that have appeared over the last 10 years have been provoked by viruses. All of them viruses that have come from animals and that have evolved, crossed species, and now affect the human population. In parallel, many viruses that were confined to one part of the planet have spread to other continents by using animals and people as their means of transport. Faced with this threat, all research related to emerging diseases is carried out under strict safety measures. The scientist heading this line of research is Marshall Bloom. Marshall runs the Rocky Mountains Laboratory, a center set in the middle of nature and dedicated to researching new infectious agents from wild animals. Since the mid-1970s, there have been over two dozen new infections which have been described in human beings which had never been previously heard, heard of before. They are in nature, seeking shelter in a wild animal that they don't harm. They use it as a host. It could be a mammal that migrates, or a bird that with every flight, transports the viruses it carries within it. That is how viruses travel easily from one place to another on the planet. Wherever they arrive, they transmit themselves to humans through arthropods, mosquitoes, ticks. They can start an outbreak, an epidemic, or establish themselves forever. This is what happened with the West Nile virus, the trail of which is being followed by Marshall Bloom. This scientist is a great expert in fly fishing for trout. It is through this sport that he is in permanent contact with the nature in which the West Nile virus has found its own hiding place. Isolated in Uganda until barely 70 years ago, the virus came to the United States in 1999. It appeared suddenly, infecting birds in the New York Zoo. Exactly how that virus got to the United States from the European continent and, and at the African continent isn't known, but it's here and within a very short period of about four or five years, it's swept across the entire United States. In just a few months, it caused 700 deaths in the population. More of a traveler and more widespread today is one of the main viruses being studied in the Rocky Mountain Laboratory the tick-borne virus that causes encephalitis in humans. It arrived in Europe and North America, one suspects, because of the climatic change that provoked a new global distribution of ticks, the vector that transmits it. The population is exposed to infection by this virus through contact with nature, with a simple stroll through the mountains and develops neurological problems that can lead to Parkinson's and paralysis. Or dengue, the main viral disease transmitted by mosquitoes throughout the world. From Southeast Asia, where the virus emerged, it has gone on to infect populations in America, the Eastern Mediterranean and the West Pacific. Today, the virus causes 50 million infections a year and lives permanently, is endemic, in 100 countries. So the answer is yes, 
viruses which emerge into human populations from animal populations now are a very serious risk. Despite nature's role as the main source for new viruses and in the emergence of natural epidemic outbreaks, international efforts against viruses appear to be focused on bioterrorism, on the possibility of a deliberate attack against the population using a virus as a biological weapon. There are hundreds of websites, guidelines, and manuals from health bodies, armies, and governments on how to act and what to do in the event of a bioterrorist attack. They reflect the fear of the appearance of a new disease, recalling the specters of those already experienced. Smallpox, the virus that caused, without the need for human intervention, some of the largest pandemics in all history, continues to be the most feared infectious agent. Smallpox as a disease is certainly one that would be the most, one of the most frightening in terms of its ability to both cause severe disease, severe fever and disfiguring rash, um, as well as the opportunity of this agent to transmit between humans. Since smallpox was eradicated thanks to the worldwide application of a vaccine, and as the virus has no hiding place in nature, an international agreement was reached to keep the virus frozen in two centers, the State Center for Virology Research in Russia and the CDC in Atlanta, where it is confined in the department coordinated by Inger Damon. Well, I think certainly the hope is that, that nobody has it, but I think there are some concerns um, that, that other individuals may actually have the virus. And the suspicion is not just that other persons might hold the smallpox virus, but that they might be thinking of using it against the population. Is the person who has it in his custody really afraid that a bioterrorist attack might be being prepared? I, I'm not sure I have enough knowledge to, you know, be able to make a, a sensible statement about that. Um, I think um, if the virus were ever released, it certainly would be something that we would want to be able to rapidly respond to, and I think that's prompted um, a lot of the concerns and a lot of the research and the work that's been done. I think one of the most important things that people need to remember is what our director Dr. Anthony Fauci always says is that really nature is the worst bioterrorist. And so although bioterrorism is one of the reasons that we have to worry about new infections, viruses or bacteria which pop up in places where they've never been before, it's probably in the long run maybe not going to be the most important thing to worry about. There are about a, close to a half a dozen or more reasons that new viruses emerge and cause infectious diseases. And we need to take all of those into account. That includes climate change, uh, crowded populations, uh, changes in, in human behavior, uh, human food processing, international travel. Someone can get sick in Africa and be back in the United States or in Europe in less than a day. So there are a variety of reasons that we really, really need to worry about emerging viruses. But international politics have not yet set as a priority the strengthening of vigilance and providing an urgent response to the increasingly more detectable appearance of new viruses. The World Health Organization, the body entrusted with this mission, recognizes that it does not have all the resources it needs to face up to the emerging diseases. Is, is there adequate surveillance uh, for new diseases? No, there's not. There, there are lots of gaps in our surveillance system. So in many places in the world, we really don't know what's going on. We'll only pick up uh, an outbreak once it's grown uh, to become a news story, uh, become a local concern. The response is stretched thin and it can be overwhelmed. It needs to be stronger.